Tennessee Life is sponsored by The Flower Pot. For over 100 years, offering flowers and same-day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations, knoxvilleflowerpot.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up on this edition of Tennessee Life, we visit a butcher, a baker, and a candle maker. We start with a visit to Lazy J Farms Butcher Shop in Kingsport, where Butch Jarvis has gone back to his roots in old-fashioned butchering. People come in here for the first time, and they say, oh my God, this place smells good. It don't even smell like a butcher shop. It's just so clean, it looks clean. Well, that's, that's my heritage, because I grew up in it. And, and uh, if we didn't clean it right the first time, we got to do it again. This neighborhood bakery turns out hundreds of loaves of sourdough, rolls, and bagels every week. The customers get to see and smell the whole process. Yeah, we're, we're tucked away in a small space, and because it's such a small space, there's not really a lot of difference between where you'd come in to buy your bread and where we're shaping the bread, where we're baking it. It's very out in the open, and I think people enjoy that. I enjoy it. You can see your products being made by hand, being baked by hand, being done the right way, in my opinion. And a wedding favor was the spark behind this candle business. The makers behind these hometown candles hope good ingredients and good scents bring about good memories. For candles and for the scents, people are drawn to them. It releases a memory of some sort to you. And that's what we want, people to be able to find a scent that triggers a memory, a good memory. And then you light it when you come in and it takes you back to that moment. Those stories next on Tennessee Live. Thanks for joining us for this Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker edition of Tennessee Life. I'm Vicki Lawson. We start with the butcher shop in Kingsport. Butch Jarvis decided to change careers and now he provides 100% farm to table meat sourced from a rare breed. Well, I grew up in the meat business. All my, all my family from my mother's side of the family has uh, been meat cutters or butchers. Uh, throughout their life, including my mom worked in the meat department also. The best I can remember back, I was probably eight or nine years old, about five miles from here in the slaughterhouse here in Kingsport uh, that I can, as far back as I can remember, and helping my granddaddy, who was by far the best uh, butcher in, I've ever met, or many people that I've met said they've ever met, so he could, he could slaughter a beef and have it on a rail in like 20 minutes. It's like nobody can do that. Even, even the slaughterhouse we use today says it takes them like an hour to put one on the rail with all current technology, you know, and he done it nothing flat. All right, well, we've got a hind quarter here that we're gonna break down. Come off the rail, been aging about 10 days. So from there on, uh, you know, we, and the slaughterhouse business there helping him up to my uh, early teenage days and we moved to uh, Ryko, Virginia where we had a 500 some acre farm, raised cattle and hay there and, and we built, a, family built a new slaughterhouse over there and worked every afternoon after school we'd clean and, and help in the, in the slaughterhouse. Me and my cousin, we, uh, we were about the same age and you know we played football and basketball and you know, we'd go to school all day and then we usually have practice after school and then we'd come in, you know, we'd be tired, right? So we'd come in and then we had to, had the slaughterhouse to clean up, which took hours, you know. So, you know, usually getting home, going to bed 10, 11 o'clock and I have to get back up at 6.30 next morning to go to school. So, and if by far, if anything was missed, if we didn't clean something properly, we heard about it the next day. There was no doubt about it. My uncles, they made sure everything was clean. Probably one of the cleanest places you've ever been in your life. And we've had a lot of comments comes in here. People come in here for the first time and they say, oh my God, this place smells good. It don't even smell like a butcher shop. It's just so clean. It looks clean. Well, that's, that's my heritage because I grew up in it. And, and uh, if we didn't clean it right the first time, we got to do it again. As I grew up and graduated, uh, graduated when I was 17 years old, so I, I started working at my uncle's uh, uh, meat market in Weber City. Uh, Hutchins Meat Market and uh, worked there for a few years and uh, like most young kids I just decided I wanted to do something different so I left and for several decades after leaving the meat business to start with I was out doing construction work traveling across the country building operating rooms. Pretty high demand job, uh, good pay and uh, we enjoyed it. Um, had a lot of time off and made good money so we could take time off. So. 
But anyway, COVID came in and um, they cut us off. They wouldn't let us go in the operating room to work anymore. So I, here I got this big farm with all these cattle and I've been selling them at the stock market and, you know, and I was taking some losses, but it didn't matter because I was making decent money doing what I was doing. I, the farming was just an enjoyment to me. I enjoyed farming. Enjoyed getting out on the tractor and riding, cutting hay and just enjoying the days, the scenery, and the, the wildlife is just wonderful. So that was just bringing me back to my roots there. I really enjoyed that. So, but now I needed to make some money off the farm. So I thought, well, I, I need to do something. I had this building in Kingsport that was not in the best location, but wasn't a bad location for a butcher shop because it's a specialty item. So I figured if it's good enough, they'll come to you. So I said, okay. So it took me almost a year to remodel this building that I had and open up. And then uh, we opened up and it wasn't like six weeks after we opened up, they called me up and wanted me to go to South Carolina and build some operating rooms. And I said, sorry, can't do it, I'm busy. Break this loin off this. We raise a specialty breed of beef, which is very unique to this country. It's a French breed of beef. Uh, it's, it's very, very limited supply in this part in the whole United States. Uh, it's called Blonde Aquitaines, and I found this breed about about eight years ago and started raising them. Uh, the greatest beef cattle in the world. It's kind of amazing that I, how I found them. I was at a, a cattle sales barn one day and saw one, and I just the cow was so amazing. I, I had to find out what kind of breed it was. So I went home and I looked it up online because I'd never seen this cow before. You got to remember, I grew up in the meat business. I grew up on a farm and I've never seen this type of breed before. So I started searching through the computer, looking at breeds, and as soon as the picture popped up, I knew that was it. And I said, oh my God, that, that's it right there. So I went online and started searching farms with that breed, and I found the nearest one was uh, down in Alabama. So I called the gentleman up, and uh, his name was Clayton, super nice guy. I called him up, I said, uh, would you mind, sir, if I come down to your farm this weekend and, and visit for a few hours? It's like a seven hour drive from here so uh took off went down there met him he took us around his farm had a beautiful farm beautiful animals i ended up buying a couple bulls and a couple cows had to twist his arm by the cows he didn't even want to sell the cows but i ended up out of there and i was getting ready to leave and he said here i want to give you something before you leave so he gave me a, a pack of hamburger and a couple t-bone steaks so i drove home it's about seven hours I got home and said i gotta try these steaks out so i I put a little oil in the pan because I didn't want to affect the flavor. I wanted to see what the natural flavor was. So I put a little oil in the pan, put them on the pan, fried them, put just a little bit of salt and pepper on them, just something to, to blow up the, the original taste of the meat. And I beat in that steak and I said, oh my God, get them Anguses off my farm. So I sold all my Anguses and bought all blondes. It's the best tasting meat I've ever eaten in my life. So we have a about a 500 acre farm that we operate on in uh, Greene County, Tennessee, which is about 30 minutes from here. And uh, we raise the cattle, cow-calf operation, and then we uh, finish the, the calves and raise them up to uh, slaughter age. And we take them to a local slaughterhouse about 10 minutes from our farm where we can get them USDA inspected at Stone Mountain down in Bellington, Tennessee. After they're slaughtered, they hang there for about 24 hours, 48 hours. We go back in a refrigerated truck we have and pick them up in whole carcasses and bring them here, break them down in the quarters and stuff and hang them in our walk-in coolers and age them anywhere from eight to 12 days, depending on the size of the beef. And then when they're ready to cut, we bring them out and we put them on a cutting table and we break them down. So, so you've got a whole carcass of beef that you're breaking down and cutting each individual piece out of, sawing it, cutting your steaks, cutting your roast. And as we cut it, we, we cut it to each individual item, such as T-bone steaks or porterhouse or New York strips, uh, filet mignon, and we vacuum pack it. We put it straight into vacuum packs, which totally preserves the freshness of the meats. Uh, you can easily take a vacuum pack meat that's packed fresh and take it home, put it in your refrigerator, and 10 days later you can open that vacuum pack up and it's just like the day you bought it. So it's, it's the best way to go. We use no preservatives. Uh, everything here is we try to raise from the farm to table. We do fresh farm eggs. We do the pork. Um, uh, we don't buy any outside cattle other than a few sister, I call them sister farms across the country that does the exact same operation that we do and they're closed farms. We don't take any cattle in from the outside stock markets or anything because they're real rare. There's only about 50 
uh, registered farms in this country. There's not a day we're open that we don't have customers come in here and say it's the first time they've been here. And I usually, if I hear them say that, I usually holler over, or come over and ask them, say, well, how'd you hear about us? And sometimes they'll hear, you know, see an ad or they're just doing some search on Google or Facebook or something and see us. But majority of the time, they say that they was over at a friend's house and they were cooking out and they ate. Or uh, somebody told them, said, man, you got to go over and check this place out. And then it's just the word of mouth. They, they, they come in here and they're, they're glad to get their product. They go home and they eat it and they come back and they say, oh, my God, that's the best I ever ate. And, and it just makes you have a good warm feeling about you know what you're doing, that you're providing a good product at a reasonable cost to, that people can afford. And they just keep coming in. And then they tell their neighbors and they tell their friends. And they just more and more people come on. We've grown from this time last year, we had a following on Facebook of around 2,000 people. We're well over 7,100 people now a year later. So it, so it just keeps growing. And, uh, and like I said, there's not a day that we're open that we don't have a new customer. And they usually announce themselves. They'll come and say, that's the first time here, we're checking you out. So it, it's great. I mean, it's a, it's a good feeling to know that people talk about you and say, hey, come try this place out. It's a good place to eat. So they come and get to meet and they try it and they come back. And then they usually bring somebody else. Then we've got the whole round here. So then we go to separate it. Later on Tennessee Live, homemade, hometown candles that live up to their 865 area code. But next, we head to the little bakery that's creating a big following with regulars and restaurants. There's nothing like the smell of homemade bread fresh out of the oven. Every day at Payson Bakery, you'll find Blake turning out hundreds of loaves, rolls, and bagels. We visit Payson as the bread was rising and baking, and the regulars were starting to arrive. Well, it's, it's very aesthetically pleasing. It's, it's you know, it's very hands-on. You're making something with your hands, and it's fascinating to to learn something to be so simple but yet so complicated at the same time. To kind of figure out all the nuances of it, and it's just a uh, it's a lifetime craft that, you know, you're just always kind of chasing. I was also a chef here in Knoxville at Knox Mason, and they asked me to start baking bread for them, and it kind of grew from there. I kind of got obsessed with it, especially with sourdough. I mean, I know I have notebooks of just notes jotted down where I would bake at home and take notes, like figure it out. And got real obsessed with it and just started baking more and more. And it kind of grew gradually, grew very organically up to the point to where um, I decided to, to kind of go out on my own and start selling at the farmer's market. And that's where the business first bloomed was at that farmer's market, just bringing sourdough bread and a couple pastries to the, to the farmer's market. It's just a nice wet dough. Once the farmer's market started, things just kind of took off quickly, you know. A few weeks in, we had a line, people lined up. We were, I was selling out of bread every week, just couldn't make enough. And, as that grew and grew and grew, well, we slowly added more restaurants, supplying them, and then it came a time where it was like, I think we should open a brick and mortar and have my own space to come to every day. So we called the bakery Payson, which is French for the word peasant, because it's big, rustic, crusty bread, and I love the rustic sim simplicity of you know, peasant bread, you know, countrymen. The name seemed to fit well for what, what I did. The whole business, the whole bakery, what we do, the, the, the heart of it is our sourdough leaven, which we feed every day, we take care of. I've had it for a little over five years now. Still have the original sourdough culture that I started with. And all the bread we do starts with our sourdough starter that I originally obsessed over to get right, to figure out all the nuances, how to work with it, you know. And science to keeping that sourdough starter consistent, you know, that's, that's kind of where that craft comes in. And then knowing how to work with the elements and getting the bread to work for you as opposed to you working for the bread. I would describe our retail bakery a lot like that first peasant bread that we created. You know, it's, it's rustic and simple, but it's comforting, inviting. It's small, you know, we, we bake out of a 600 square foot little spot, but we, we make it work and, 
you know, we do a lot of product for restaurants. We do a lot of bagels, a lot of sandwiches out of the retail spot. And I'm always amazed at what we're able to get out of this little spot. And I think it, it's reminiscent of the bagel shops you see in New York, of the old bakeries you might see in Europe where it's just, they're just pumping stuff out. And, you know, you kind of see it from the outside. And you're like, how, how do they do that? And, you know, I feel, I feel grateful that we're able to do, to do that now. Yeah, we're, we're tucked away in a small space, and because it's such a small space, there's not really a lot of difference between where you'd come in to buy your bread and where we're shaping the bread, where we're baking it. Where it's very out in the open, and I, I think people enjoy that. I enjoy it. You can see your products being made by hand, being baked by hand, being done the right way, in my opinion, which is what I feel Knoxville has been turning towards over the past 10 years that I've seen in the food industry. They want, they want to see where their food's made. They want it local. They want it, they want it handmade and they're, you know, they're responding to it. And I'm, I'm an example of that, you know, that response. On a typical day, we get going four or five in the morning. You know, we bake the bagels fresh. Any bagel you see in the shop was baked that day. That's the only way we sell it. If there's leftover, we'll turn it into bagel chips. We sell, sell those to restaurants. Uh, we'll bake our sourdough bread, focaccia. Uh, we bake a lot of burger buns, especially for the restaurants in the area. We sell 700 burger buns a week, thousands of bagels a week, all in this, in this little space. One unique thing we offer is our cannelet, which is a custardy French pastry that's kind of finicky and hard to make, but it was something we were able to get down eventually and really took off. Something you can't, you don't see very often in this area especially, but it's traditionally made with rum and to kind of drive home our southern flair within this uh, European, you know, French style bakery that we do was we use whiskey instead of the rum. The bakery is very neighborhood oriented, very, very engaging. I see them as people, I see them as friends, you know, a lot of people do get regulars, regular stuff and, you know, we'll have their, their bagel going for them as we see them walk, walk up to the door. We get a lot of compliments on our bagels from people from the Northeast, from the New York area who say, you know, I moved from this area years ago and this is the first real bagel I've been able to find, you know, it kind of reminds me of home and that's always a big compliment. We have European customers at the farmer's market who say it reminds them of home. You know, people in the military say that, you know, they toured throughout Europe and, you know, it reminds them of that bread. And me being self-taught and not really getting to go to these places, I feel, I feel really good that I was able to replicate that without, you know, going there. I was born and raised here in Tennessee and grew up with not a lot of money, so traveling was never much of an option. And I was able to teach myself this bread from these different areas. and to get the compliments from people from those areas, how much it reminds them of home makes me feel really good. Going from being a chef to deciding that I want to be a baker and to see myself here owning a bakery is a, is a dream come true. Burn, smell, enjoy. A plan for creating wedding favors and a love for living in East Tennessee were the sparks for the 865 Candle Company. It's not necessarily the candle, it's the smell. It's the scent. Scents trigger memories for people and those memories are so incredibly important. It's a connection between an emotion and a memory and those are so incredibly powerful. We're getting married and we wanted to come up with a wedding favor that was something that was just personalized, something that we could give to our guests that, you know, wouldn't be thrown in the trash or on the way out of the building. So um, we researched what it would a candle would look like and played around with the idea of maybe buying one as favors. And then we're like, well, how hard could it be to make? We wanted to make it ourselves so that it could be a personalized gift. So candles were one way that we made for our guests. And so it took months, but we slowly got, I think we had 200 candles. And then they ended up being a big hit for the wedding. So after the wedding, you clean up and kind of get stuff out of there. All the candles were gone. Um, there wasn't a single one left. And a few weeks after the fact, people were sending us messages, hey, the candle's awesome, it smells great. Um, this is wonderful, do you have any more left? We're like, no, we don't have any more left. They're like, well, you should make some more. We're like, no, we don't. We have two jobs, we have three kids, two dogs. It's just not feasible. 
My daughter, Riley, and her husband, Dusty, are trying to adopt a baby, so they needed a fundraiser also. So we did candles for the holiday, for Christmas, and they had two cents, and then they did the fundraiser. They sold them. We made them for them. And after the fact, people were like, do you have any more of those candles left? And we're like, no. Well, you should make some more. No. People wanted more and more, so we thought, why not? Somebody said, start a business. And I think that one thing just kind of built onto another, and then we were like, oh, well, maybe we could do this. AJ and I got married in October of 2017, and we launched 865 Candle Company in March of 2018. Our name was pretty important, 865's home. I grew up in Florida, and I've been here since my undergraduate years, and then got my master's degree at the University of Tennessee. So this is home, and 865 is everything ball, it's everything you know here. I've never been in a city where an area code means so much to the people around you, and we wanted to encompass that passion and that kind of that volunteer spirit. It's just, it's so prevalent here and it's not like anything I had ever experienced prior to coming to East Tennessee. So we wanted to represent that in the best way we could. We are Knoxville. We do this out of our living room, our kitchen, our dining room, our office, that we are a small business out of 865 area code. During the day, I have a regular job, eight to five, and then we do candle stuff from five till, you know, sometimes midnight. So What's the saying that you know, there's 24 hours in a day, I'm probably using about 16, 18 of them. But after dinner and after cleanup, you know, we get in there and we do small batches of candles. It's usually about two pounds at a time. And each batch is melted two pounds at a time, fragrance is added. And then, you know, they sit and they cure once they're poured. Making a candle is more than just pouring the wax and throwing a scent in there and putting a lid on it and giving it away. You actually have to take your time. You have to measure everything. You have to let it cool. Once you get the scent and the wax together, you pour it into the vessel or the glass that you've picked. And then it has to sit up to two weeks in that one spot. You want the wax and the scent to combine, to, to bind together and be the best scent you can have. I think the thing that sets our candles apart is the cold throw that people get when they just first open up the candle. Cold throw is when you take the lid off a candle, that's the first thing you will smell. And that's the strongest smell you'll get. So every time, each time you put the lid back on the candle and you open it again, that's your cold throw because no burning has happened yet. Candles are a dime a dozen. You can get them just about anywhere. So we knew that our packaging had to be different. It had to stand out. We knew the way we made the candle had to be important. We knew that we didn't want to do a cheap end. We wanted it to be something that if you're going to buy it from us, we're going to feel really good about you burning that in your house. So all the way down to our ingredients and what we put in our candles, we use all natural soy wax. Other fragrances that we choose are phylate free. Phylates are actually what's connected to carcinogens. And when you light your candle, a lot of people don't realize that they're letting carcinogens into the air. And then nitro musk free. And nitro musk is a complicated little guy, but basically um, the easy version is, is it's what causes a lot of people headaches. So a lot of our fragrances, almost all of them are nitro musk free as well. And then when you get down to the wick, what a lot of people don't know is that a wick can have lead and mercury in it. So we actually have wicks that are a paper core, heavily wrapped in cotton, so that when you're burning your candle, it's, it, it's a pretty clean burn. There's no paraffin in our candles, um, and we try to keep basically all the yuck out. When people think a candle's a candle, we just try to talk to them and explain the wax, how it's a clean burn, how we have the paper cores and wrapped in cotton for our cotton wicks, how the wood is not dipped in accelerants. Um, it's just a cleaner burn. We do do a wood wick also. Um, the wood wick is what we launched the company with and we, add the, we added the cotton wick um, probably about nine months later. Our wood wick is an all natural piece of wood. It is not dipped in an accelerant. Wood wicks are cool to me because I had a passion for kind of woodworking. I love to work with my hands. So a wood wick was a gimme and we knew that that also set us apart because most times when you buy a candle, it's a cotton wick. So having that wood wick that also has that subtle crackling like a fireplace um, is kind of nice in the background. What we've learned about scents and aromas is that everybody's nose is different. And we really try to have something that is going to trigger something for everyone. I'm not a huge fan of floral scents, but we carry them usually in the spring. I'm typically more of a musky, AJ is more, you know, kind of a clean scented person. So, you know, our most popular clean scents are lavender lemon, rosemary mint. If you get into the musky category, our Popular ones are oak, moss, and amber, or leather and tobacco. My favorite candle right now is probably the Barber. 
I always describe it as kind of a clean scent that has real musky undertones. Uh, the top is basil leaf uh, and bergamot, and then underneath is kind of white, uh, white patchouli, I believe in some sandalwood. I love it. It's all about the memory for me. I want somebody to remember, have a memory over the scent they are given. For candles and for the scents, people are drawn to them. It releases a memory of some sort to you. When you come into our house, you're gonna smell a crisp apple and it's gonna remind you of something, a memory you had. And that's what we want, people to be able to find a scent that triggers a memory, a good memory. And then you light it when you come in and it takes you back to that moment. We hope you can support your favorite Tennessee butchers, bakers, and candle makers. I'm Vicki Lawson. See you on the next Tennessee Live.